So we're going to be talking about managing the crisis five steps at a time. Um, this is mainly going to cover the first chapters of the Lanny Davis book, um, which I've posted for you guys on As You Learn. And we'll be talking about the Anthonson reading, which gives a little bit more of an international perspective on crisis communication. There are a couple of YouTube videos in this lecture. Um, I can make those YouTube videos available to you if you want to watch them at another time, but we will play them as part of our lecture today. So first of all, just some announcements. Um, make sure you complete your crisis plan proposal this week. If you have specific questions about how to do that, um, the information is in the assignment, but I'm gladly willing to answer any questions you have for that assignment. So in the Anthonson reading um, that we had for this week, one of the things they talk about is that there is no guarantee that a crisis response will work well. Um, this is kind of anti that whole excellence theory that we talked about in our last module. And, um, and so that's really hard to think about, this whole idea of chaos being a factor um, and knowing that you know, your crisis plan um, is only as resilient as, as you can make it. Um, the other thing that's important that I took away from this reading is this idea that stakeholders are everywhere. So you have to acknowledge the recognizable stakeholders, but also stakeholders that you might not consider to be, um, you know, stakeholders at a very early time. And this is made really challenging because of social media. Um, another quote that I really like for um, another thing that Anthonson talks about in this chapter is that for some reason it seems like there are a lot more crises and a lot more frequent crises now, um, but that is a result of social media. And um, social media also makes it to where you have to be much more accountable. You really have to respond in those like five seconds or five minutes, 15 minutes on social media as opposed to waiting 24 hours to respond, which used to be the standard. Um, and then this idea of what are threats. A lot of times people identify threats, but they don't think about certain threats that are um, that exist because they haven't really thought about um, that being a threat to their company in the first place. Um, so that's really important to think about. Um, one of the other things he mentions is that successful crisis communication um, must assume the worst. Um, it must always assume that there is going to be a catastrophe, that there's going to be a problem. You know, we plan for the best and worst of all possible situations. I'll say that multiple times. Um, and also, you don't want to lose time um, because you weren't prepared. And so I think that's really important to think about, too, is that losing time is, is um, it always takes place if you don't know who's what's supposed to do what or you don't have a crisis plan. So that's one of the reasons why we cover crisis plans um, very first in this class. Um, always put people first. A lot of times in crisis management circles, it will be much more about like losing money. Um, but if you're more concerned about money than people, that eventually catches up to you in organization. So make sure people always come first and that you take care of the people associated with your organization and those that are affected by your organization. Um, and then the last thing is always learn from what happened. You can always do better. Even if it seems like you've had a really great crisis response, you can always do better the next time. And it's really important to do that process of evaluation so that you can, um, you can make your response better every time. Um, so in the book, Crisis Tales by Lanny Davis, um, they talk about coping with crises. And Lanny Davis is a lawyer. Um, he does PR and he has lots of media knowledge. Um, so he kind of lives in multiple areas. Um, he also uh, worked with the Clintons during the Whitewater scandal and the Monica Lewinsky scandal in the 90s. So he's really well known for that. Um, he's also well known for being very um, amenable with the press and reporters and giving reporters what they want. And that's something we're going to talk about a lot is, you know, when the media sees that you're not willing to work with them, um, that can really affect what messages you're able to get out. And so Lanny Davis uh, does a lot of coaching about that. Um, he talks about how that's really important. One of the things I want to mention about Lanny Davis is although Lanny Davis has worked with the Clintons and that he is a, um, 
he is a media lawyer um, per se. Um, he's worked with clients who are both Republican and Democrat. He's worked with businessmen and sports people and celebrities. So he has a pretty wide portfolio of people he's worked with. Um, and, and I think that he's really truly a professional, regardless of what your political orientation is, that we can all learn a lot from him. So I'm sharing this book with you um, just because I think he has a really great um, a really great perspective and he has a lot of really great experience that I personally don't have. Um, he's been doing this for more than 25 years. So it's, uh, it's, it's really useful. Um, one of the things that he wants you to think about in his book is what do you do? How do you respond and how do you fight back? And those are going to be the three kind of key things that he talks about in each chapter. So when I was talking about note taking and what you're supposed to take notes on, this is something that's really useful for you to think about when you're reading each one of his chapters. Here's a little video that he has um, from Hillary YouTube. Clinton pulled off a crooked land deal. Remember Whitewater? False. She was held responsible for the murder of White House lawyer Vince Foster. False. And the Clintons ran drugs out of Arkansas, killing dozens of people in the process. Really, really false. Not only did we lose money on a piece of property called Whitewater Estates, the investment would spawn an investigation 15 years later that endured throughout Bill's presidency. It all started one day in the spring of 1978 when a businessman and longtime politico named Jim McDougall approached us with a sure thing deal. Bill and I had entered a partnership with Jim and his young wife, Susan, to buy 230 undeveloped acres on the south bank of the White River in North Arkansas. The plan was to subdivide the site for vacation homes, then sell the lots at a profit. The price was $202,611.20. Jim McDougall was a character, charming, witty, and eccentric as the day is long. With his white suits and baby blue Bentley, McDougall looked as if he'd just stepped out of a Tennessee Williams play. Despite his colorful habits, he had a solid reputation. He seemed to do business with everybody in the state, including the impeccable Senator J. William Fulbright, for whom he helped make a fortune in real estate. His credentials were reassuring to both of us. If all had gone according to plan, we would have turned over the investment after a few years, and that would have been the end of it. But by the time the development was surveyed and the lots were ready for sale, interest rates had gone through the roof. Rather than take a huge loss, we held on to Whitewater, making some improvements and building a model home while hoping for an economic turnaround. From time to time over the next several years, Jim asked us to write checks to help make interest payments or other contributions, and we never questioned his judgment. We didn't realize that he was becoming involved in a raft of dubious business schemes. Travelgate, as it came to be known in the media, was perhaps worthy of a two or three week lifespan. Instead, in a partisan political climate, it became the first manifestation of an obsession for investigation that persisted into the next millennium. Before we moved into the White House, neither Bill nor I nor our immediate staff had known that there was a White House travel office. The travel office charters planes, books hotel rooms, orders meals, and generally takes care of the press when they travel with the president. An audit had discovered that the director of the travel office kept an off-book ledger that a minimum of $18,000 of checks had not been properly accounted for and that the office's records were in shambles. Based on these findings, Mac and the White House Counsel's Office decided to fire the travel office staff and reorganize the department. These actions, which seemed like no-brainers to the decision makers involved, ignited a firestorm. At least seven separate investigations including those conducted by the White House, the General Accounting Office, the FBI, and Kenneth Starr's Office of the Independent Counsel, failed to turn up any illegality, wrongdoing, or conflicts of interest by anyone in the administration, and confirmed that the initial concerns about the travel office were justified. So that's just a piece of the piece um, that was produced as a result of Lanny Davis having Hillary Clinton speak to Time Magazine. Um, and Lanny Davis is known kind of for his assistance of Hillary Clinton and making that information come out. 
um, in detail um, where she recounted kind of her interaction with Whitewater. Um, that video goes on for about 10 and a half minutes and it's basically her reading the magazine article. Um, so you can go check that out on your own time. Um, so like I said, Lanny Davis um, is the person who wrote this book and it's based off of his um, his coping with crisis as an individual and also as a professional. Um, so he gives several, he gives five rules which he dissects in his book. Um, the first one is get all the facts out and so one of the things he says is really important to do is to get all the information out and be transparent as possible. Um, he says it's also important to communicate with the media and put the facts into simple messages that people can understand. Um, that's his second point. His third one is to get ahead of the story, and his fourth is to fight for the truth using law, media, and politics. So using the tools you have in place to do what you need to do. And then lastly, to never represent yourself in a crisis. And he talks about a time when he actually um, was kind of, um, he was attacked by the media. Um, he gives several interesting um, examples of people who didn't follow these five rules. So um, he gives Nixon, Exxon Valdez, which we'll read about in our Fern Bakes book. Um, what happened with Senator John Edwards, I'm sure you guys remember when John Edwards was running for president and um, he had a mistress and then had a child with his mistress and then uh, subsequently his, his uh, wife died of cancer, which was uh, his wife was dealing with cancer at the time. Um, Herman Cain, who was a Republican candidate that ended up having um, some relationships with a prostitute, um, the Sloinger loan program and the Obama administration, um, Susan G. Komen, Nancy Brinker's interaction with Planned Parenthood, and then the issue with Matt, Mitt Romney's uh, tax returns. All right, this is. This is a video right here um, I'm going to share with you, just kind of about Lenny Davis. I wanted to go to Martha Stewart just for a moment. That was the first part of your, in the first part of your book. And as you said, Martha Stewart did not get convicted of insider trading, but she did get accused and convicted of making false statements. And the thought crossed my mind, is that other than terrible judgment by President Clinton, while in the White House. Was that also something similar to what he was convicted of? Well, in the world of public opinion, President Clinton was untruthful about a topic that is highly sensitive, that usually, if it weren't about a person in public life, would be a matter between uh, a spouse and a companion. And in President Clinton's case, that played out in public. It plays out in many other instances in public life. Uh, the American people, myself included, don't forgive that behavior, uh, rather don't defend that behavior, but we do forgive that behavior because we all know that we all have human weaknesses and uh, they are but for the graces, the scripture teaching about we are all sinners. But I also have great faith in the wisdom and fairness of the American people in being able to distinguish serious personal weaknesses that led to that situation with performance in office, which is what we expect presidents to do. So at the end of the Clinton presidency, despite everything, on his last day in office, he had a 65% job approval rating, the highest approval rating of any second term president since polling was invented. So I guess my answer is, yes, uh, there was a judgment made by the American people, most people, that what he did was wrong, personally, but a matter more between him and his wife than anybody else. Uh, his stating untruths, falsehoods was wrong, and he took a terrible consequence for those mistakes. But at the end of the day, as I guess the old expression goes, look at him now. What a truly great man around the world. And uh, my friend Hillary isn't so bad either, so. He survived a terrible ordeal, and I'm, I'm very proud of his presence. So one of the things they're talking about um, in the video at the beginning is this issue with Martha Stewart. And if you read the first chapter that you were assigned for today, 
Um, this is um, Martha Stewart, you know, who was arrested for insider trading. Um, here's some memes that actually were created during that time. Everybody likes to think that memes are a new thing, but the New York Post cover here, um, basically Martha Stewart goes to prison, uh, get out of jail free card, and then, um, you know, a mock-up of her Martha Stewart Living magazine um, here. But this is the situation from the book that Lanny Davis helped her deal with. Oh. You can click on this video inside your um, inside your information. So if you'll just take a couple minutes to stop this video and go open the YouTube link below our video. And as you learn, you can find the Martha Stewart video there. So the issue with Martha Stewart was basically, Martha Stewart, please keep your mouth shut. That's basically what he says is, you know, don't answer questions that you don't feel comfortable answering, but just tell them the truth. And the truth was that she didn't really understand much about trading. She had hired someone to do it. And basically the person had recommended that she make a certain decision. And so she, you know, made that decision and did something and she agreed that what she had done was wrong, but she didn't understand that what she was doing was wrong. So um, she stuck to the facts of this is what I did, but I didn't realize what I was doing was um, a wrong thing. And that actually ended up benefiting her reputation because even though she went to jail and was under house arrest for more than a year, um, you know, most people don't think about that kind of things when they think about Martha Stewart. Um, they actually probably today you think about her and Snoop Dogg's um, cooking show, which is quite fun. Um, and um, anyway, another thing that Lanny Davis talks about is this idea of crisis and opportunity. And um, here's a video of him talking about that in his text. Well, the Chinese uh, word for opportunity is also a word for crisis and vice versa. So I guess several thousand years ago, they figured that out. Yes, uh, if it's a terrible, terrible story, where you're in the middle of a scandal and you have no choice but to own up to it and to fess up and apologize, you've got to do it right. No ifs, ands, or buts. An apology is a flat out full stop apology. Then you have to do a pivot and say, here's what I'm going to do to fix it and do it all with credibility. To me, that is the best solution to not having any way to explain away the bad facts other than a flat out apology. But you'd be amazed, maybe you wouldn't be amazed, but people are sometimes amazed when I say the American people are very forgiving. The comeback kid, the story of redemption, of forgiveness, is instinctive in the American people. My proof of that is after all that President Clinton went through with his painful confession of personal weakness, when he left office, he had a 65% approval rating. And the Republicans who tried to impeach him lost seats in the Congress because the American people recognized a distinction between personal weakness, asking forgiveness, and performance in office. I always tell CEOs, if you have to own up to a mistake, if you do it the right way, your stock actually may go up, not down. So that's a very interesting thing from Lanny Davis, this idea of crisis and opportunity and the idea that if you do apologize and you apologize in the right way and try to make it right, it can make a difference. And there are gonna be several case studies in his book that illustrate that argument. Tonight, maybe. Um, so the next video is another case study that's in his book, and this is dealing with uh, Richard Scrushy. Um, it's kind of a long video, so I'll probably stop it halfway through the video and I'll also post the link for you to watch it um, if you would like to watch it. Um, anyway, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and play this, and we'll have a little conversation about it. Yet one more CEO who could face years in prison for allegedly cooking the books to make himself rich. Richard Scrooge was CEO of Health South, the Fortune 500 healthcare company he created in his hometown of Birmingham, Alabama. And now the SEC and the Justice Department allege that Health South, at Scrooge's direction, 
falsely inflated its profits by almost $3 billion to push up the price of its stock. Then last March, when one of its chief financial officers blew the whistle exposing the fraud, the stock tanked to just pennies a share, leaving thousands of investors holding the bag. Scrooge admits profits were inflated, but insists he knew nothing about it. Whether he did or he didn't, no one expected fraud from Birmingham's biggest benefactor. You can drive on the Richard Scrooge Parkway to the Richard Scrooge campus at Jefferson State Community College. Elsewhere in Birmingham, there's the Richard Scrooge Building, the Richard Scrooge Library, the Richard Scrooge Ball Field. There used to be a Richard Scrooge statue, but after someone spray painted the word thief on it and a radio DJ urged people to pull it down like Saddam's statue in Baghdad, workers removed it. Birmingham's top radio host, Paul Feinbaum, has known Scrooge for 15 years through his rise and fall. I'll make you this bet uh, that if Scrooge is indicted yep. and if he goes to jail, it won't be long before his name's on the outside. He'll find a way to make it the Richard M. Scrooge jail. I don't think he'd live in a place that didn't have his name on it. Congressional investigators have subpoenaed Richard Scrooge to testify before a subcommittee in Washington next week. His attorneys say that he'll appear, but you'll take the fifth. He won't answer any questions. So we were astonished when he agreed to answer our questions and without having his attorney in the room. You are supposed to be a crook. You know that. The SEC, in effect, says you are. Your former financial officers, chief financial officers, say you are. That Richard Scrooge inflated earnings and betrayed his stockholders, betrayed his uh, employees. There's no evidence of any of that. And uh, many of the, what people have said is not true. He told us his top financial officers committed the fraud without his knowledge. You have to rely, you have to trust people. You have to believe, you have to delegate. I mean, you hire them, you pay them good salaries, you expect them to do the right thing. And uh, I signed off on, uh, on the information based on what was provided to me and what I was told. You say you didn't keep track of the account. CEOs don't do that. CFOs do that. Chief do that. financial officer means he is the chief financial officer. Here's how the SEC describes what it calls the scheme, your scheme. Each quarter, Health South senior officers would present Scrooge with the company's actual earnings and he'd compare them to Wall Street expectations. If the actual results fell short of expectations, Scrooge would tell his management to, quote, fix it by recording false earnings to make up for the shortfall. That is not true. Well, what is true is that Scrooge started with just $50,000 and he built a Fortune 500 company. He showed us Health South landmarks while he told us how his company began 19 years ago. One room with one desk and one phone. We put on a suit every day, start shirts, wore a tie. We had no business, we had no income, we had nothing. We started with a dream and an idea, a business card with our name on it and an idea that's all we had. But Scrooge did have a medical background. He'd been a respiratory therapist helping old people who had trouble breathing. And he saw that Medicare was paying big money to diagnose and treat the elderly. So he opened clinics that were able to do that with less overhead than the larger hospitals. And after that, when he realized that athletic baby boomers were getting sports injuries that required costly rehabilitation, he specialized in that too. Hiring famous athletes who'd been his clinic's patients to help spread the word. Dan Marino, Michael Jordan, Herschel Walker. As his business prospered, Scrooge began to buy up other clinical chains creating his own healthcare empire. They're operating 17, 1800 healthcare facilities, treating almost 100,000 patients a day and, and almost 50,000 employees. And they're in all 50 states and several other countries around the world. Was he good for Birmingham for a while? He was excellent. We became the leader in healthcare, particularly in sports medicine, because of Richard Scrooge. After the scandal of the folks here in Birmingham, really, think about it. Hate him? Despise him. We're really? mortified. Scrooge's world first began to come apart last March when one of his chief financial officers went to federal prosecutors and confessed that Health South, at Scrooge's express direction, had been overstating its profits hugely for years. 
This is the federal courthouse here in Birmingham where Richard Scrooge's fate could be determined. The prosecutors, as is their custom, wouldn't talk to us on camera before trial, and they would not let their witnesses talk to us either. Uh, not right now, gentlemen. So far, 15 former Health South employees have pled guilty, including all five of Scrooge's chief financial officers. Scrooge says they did the dirty work behind his back, but the prosecutors say that when the CFOs pled guilty, they agreed to testify under oath against Scrooge. Michael Martin, chief financial officer. Let me read from the court transcript when he pled guilty. The judge asked Michael Martin, did you and Mr. Scrooge discuss the fact that the numbers contained in the filings were false? Yes, sir. Did Mr. Scrooge direct you to do something with the numbers? Yes, sir. He told me to inflate the numbers, to fix the numbers, so that they met Wall Street's expectations. So is Mike Martin just a dummy? Just some guy says, go do something, commit a, a fraud or a crime that will put you in jail, and Mike Martin just does it? You don't believe that, Mike. I would never have done that. He is not telling the truth. Tad McVeigh, CFO until early this year, 2003. So this video goes on to explain kind of how Richard Scrooge addressed people and basically they weren't able to convict him of any sort of interaction with the business, um, but the business did go under in 2008. So, um, you know, things caught up to him. Um, Lanny Davis advised him to, um, you know, not admit to anything, but to be able to speak to the, um, to the media on 60 Minutes. And like you said in the beginning, he didn't bring his lawyer with him or anything. And, and just um, he spoke to the facts of what he did and did not know. Um, one of the things here I want you to notice is this idea of the court of public opinion versus the court of, um, of law. And so, you know, when you're thinking about the court of public opinion, those things are instantaneous. They can have an instantaneous impact on what's happening to you. Whereas in the court of law, it takes things a long time to take place. You can do something wrong and then maybe three years later, you're going to be tried for it in a court of law because the way the justice system works. So it's really important to get things out um, in favor of your positive reputation. Um, not to say that you should twist what, what's going on or change the story, but it can really impact how people see you um, because if you, you know, if you don't deal with that right away, um, you know, just because there's no legal implications, it could have a bigger impact on your company and on your um, reputation over time. So let's continue the conversation. Think about crisis preparedness and response, and that's what we'll be talking about next. Um, my next lecture is going to start off talking about the Titanic, so I'm looking forward to talking to you guys about that.